Impact Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Hard to Tell Podcast, episode 195, Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca, Jew. here, another fall week, we are in October now, believe it or not, this year has gone by quickly, October folks, we are here, now, we talked about this last week, we we're very close to the start of the NBA season, basketball is right upon us, I just reactivated my league pass, super <laughs> excited, you know, you know I'm ready, you know I'm always ready, I gotta stay, I gotta stay ready. Uh, uh-huh. Brian, you know, you know, you know how this goes. Um, Brian, I know you are as ready as I am. You are excited. So except, except, except I haven't uh, gotten 2K yet. Usually, usually you and I will do that by yeah. now, but this year we're kind of like, ah, we're waiting. You know, we're waiting. The, the ratings not really, you know, like the response and the ratings not really that high. It just seems like and after a year that I didn't get 2K, you would think mm-hmm. that I'd be really eager, but <laughs> not, no, seriously, Greg, and Greg's saying we're lying in a group chat. I really don't have 2K yet. I really don't. I, I don't either. I was I playing was, I was... NCAA Basketball 10 the other day. Wow. College basketball, like, that was the last uh, college basketball game. Blake Griffin's on the cover. Great game when it doesn't lag. Wow, you were playing NCAA. You were saying a game from, okay, whatever. He's played a game John Wall and Jimmy Butler are in that game. That's a 2011 draft class. It's a good draft wow. class, I think. You have, you have way too much time on, my, on your hands that I do not. It was uh, a Sunday. <laughs> okay, all right. my Sunday was not that free, uh, and I know, and I know our guest who we're about to bring on his Sunday was also not that free. I can, right. I can guarantee you that. But to talk the start of the season, basketball right around the corner, we got to talk about the team that is on many people's minds a front runner to win the NBA championship. That would be the Brooklyn Nets, and there's nobody better to talk about the Nets than my man Michael Grady, sideline reporter for the Yes Network. You also see him with CBS Sports. Doing some sideline reporting. Grady, what up, man? Hey, what's going on, fellas? Episode 195, man. That's crazy. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the first time you came on. The first time you came on, I don't even know what episode that was. I it was like 37. It's like 37. 37, 36. Wow. Yeah. Like, that is yeah. crazy. Yeah. We were in that, that 40. We was in, it was crazy. one of our first episodes at Gotham. At Gotham. That's Grady was. was up there for that. I this is like the that. summer of 2018. This is over yeah. three years ago. Man, that's nuts. Yeah, y'all do. Yeah, the Jersey, yeah, the Jersey joints back then with, with each episode, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Now, what y'all, what y'all doing? Interstate? <laughs> we <laughs> stopped. We stopped doing that. We stopped doing that like ninety nine. <laughs> we yeah, stopped doing right. that. The area codes now, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> we shit. Are. We I are, think of that. Area we are in the area, area codes now. Word to ludicrous. We all different kinds of area codes. Not, <laughs> not, not, not get it. Not get it messy. Grady, good to see you, man. Um, it's been a while. The last time I saw you, I was in the building for Game Five Bucks Nets, and I saw you at. I think I, I ran into you because I was going to get some food in the concourse at the Barclays Center, and we were like at halftime. We were like the Nets were down what sixteen, seventeen, and we were just like. Yeah, man, this don't look good except for KD. And then the second half happened, and man, I was so glad. I I almost passed tickets up for that game that day, Grady. I oh, almost wow. didn't go. I almost didn't go, but I was glad. I was glad I was. I was in the building. So it's, it's been a while, but good to see you. Um, it's been a busy NBA off season. You had a busy off season too, uh, yourself. Uh, you've been active yeah. with the photography, doing some other things. You got married. Um, how, how was the summer? How was the off? Two seasons with short season, back to work. Like, how's Michael Gray doing right now? Man, it's been uh, it's been good, man. It's been uh, hustling for sure, man. The work has been uh, the work has been great. 
Uh, you know, um, got married, which is which is fantastic. Uh, I had a great honeymoon, and then as soon as you know, got back from the honeymoon, it's been like it's been <laughs> off, man, man. Just been been uh, been getting after it. So Yankee broadcast, which has been great to do, pregame, postgame, got a handful of those in. Um, did some stuff with Liberty. Uh, called two college football games for CBS Sports Network. Um, uh, a week ago, did the uh, did Colts Titans sidelines for. CBS and um, and then just called that preseason game number one on the Yes app with uh, Nets and Lakers. So it's been a it's been a beautiful grind, man, for sure. And now it's it's uh, time to put that put all that attention on uh, the Nets. And I just came back from San Diego and there's a week doing training camp, doing interviews with Sirius Satellite Radio, and um, and I'm just ready for basketball, brother. Ready to get back at it. I see you, bro. I see you out there grinding, man. I love seeing you doing the play-by-play Word. right now. I'm, I'm really, whenever you're doing some play-by-play, I'm, I'm happy because, you know, there ain't too many that look like us doing the play-by-play. So I'm, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm always, I'm always, I'm always right. happy about that. Uh, I know you heard yeah. Brian and I talking a little bit before we brought you in just about excitement for the season. Just taking, taking the nets aside, Grady, how excited are you for this season and just – you know, this is a year, again, I think you say the Nets, we'll talk about how they're the favorites, but last year we talked about this when we had you on. It's kind of still kind of wide open. There's a lot of possibilities that can go on here, right? There's there's possibilities because we know that over the course of the ebb and flow of an NBA season, injuries are a possibility. If we could be God and turn injuries off like we do on 2K, the Nets <laughs> and the Lakers are going to the NBA Finals. That's just what it is. If those teams are healthy, those teams are going to the NBA Finals until somebody, you know, surprises us. So in the West, again, there's no Kawhi Leonard with the, with the Clippers. Um, I don't believe in, in in Denver, and who knows when they're going to get Jamal Murray back. Um, Portland, not that squad. We got to see what Clay looks like with Golden State, and he's one of my favorite NBA players, and I'm so happy that he's back. Um, but we got to see what he looks like. But even then, they don't have the firepower of the Lakers. And so that's the Western Conference. In the East... Milwaukee certainly is a squad that with Giannis, I think they're going to try to consistently be hungry and compete at a high level. I do think losing P.J. Tucker is a big loss, given what he was able to do defensively for them. But they're still going to be a problem. I'm really interested in Miami and adding a winner like Kyle Lowry to that mix um, with Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, P.J. Tucker on that squad now. I don't know what Victor Oladipo is going to look like. But I think Miami's a very interesting, interesting team for sure. But make no mistake about it. If the Lakers and the Nets are healthy, if they're healthy, those two teams are meeting in the NBA Finals. But we know one thing about health. It affected the Nets. Milwaukee, give them credit, advance. Phoenix, I mean, all due congratulations making it to the NBA Finals. <laughs> but again, injuries, the Clippers, the Nuggets, like it's the Lakers, it's, it, it's just a thing. So... It'll be it'll be uh, fascinating to watch over the course of the NBA season. Hopefully, we're not seeing as many injuries as we saw last year because we know that crazy, crazy schedule with the games coming in rapid succession played a part in that. I don't think you know, Mike, what you just did, but I know what's that, coming. See, I, I, I knew it. I knew what was coming. Oh, oh, my, bad. my bad. Hold on, my bad. Hold on. Yeah, I got a Atlanta man. I really want to give Atlanta some love on what they okay. did last okay. year. Okay. So, okay. Want to throw Atlanta in there? Still can't compete with you know the Nets, the the the, the Bucks, Miami. Uh, we'll see about Miami. Oh, um, oh, oh! And then Philadelphia too. With those, you know, Philadelphia. We got to see what happens there. But uh, but yeah, I want to give Atlanta some love because uh, Trey Young, man, he was he was special. He uh, yeah he yeah he was lighting up the Knicks in the playoffs. Now now Mike, I, I don't think, go. I don't think you know <laughs> what you did here. You said some magic words, and the magic words with Brian is about the Miami Heat. My, Brian does not like to come out and say that he's a Miami Heat fan, but we know that he is. He just fronts to everybody on this podcast. <laughs> you said that you somewhat believe in the Miami Heat. Then you're like, oh, I don't know. I might want to hold back on this. Brian, do you have No, the only, dude, the only dude I'm holding off on is Vic. I'm, you know, the Vic, the Indiana ties, the way he, you know, the way he did yeah. Indiana, that whole thing. But Kyle, Bam, Jimmy, Tyler, like, and yet again, PJ to the mix there defensively. I'm forgetting somebody. Um, and if Vic can give you something, right? I, I I I think my I don't think people talk enough about Miami. Oh well, Brian, talk about Miami because we know you want to. Go ahead. 
<laughs> okay, th- look, look. There, there's something else that I'm working on that if it actually happens, Dex is gonna laugh his ass off, and I'll just leave that there. Um, uh, as far as uh, the the heat go, yeah, I told you, Dex, on the last pod, and I've told you this uh, otherwise. We haven't gotten deep into it yet because the season hasn't started, but I think that they can go really far in the playoffs again. I don't necessarily think that they're where the Nets or Bucks should be yet. Mm-hmm. In terms of like Eastern Conference hierarchy, I think they're probably the, the best of the next group, uh, you know, pending on what happens with Philadelphia, although, although I don't know how much better they're going to get trading Ben Simmons. And then uh, Atlanta, I'm kind of like wait and see with them because I, I'm not as high on them as some people are <laughs> heading into this year. I think they're really good. And I think that, you know, they should be commended for what they did last year. I just think it's going to be more difficult this year because the Eastern Conference and then, you know, the Celtics are a team that like, I don't know how to feel about them, but I'm not necessarily sleeping on them because they have a little more depth than I realize. Uh, and then in the West, the only team Grady didn't mention was Dallas, who I'm pretty high on this year. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens in, in Luca's. Uh... Wait, wait, wait. Tell Grady what you did on the last podcast. Please tell Grady what you did on the last podcast. That was ridiculous. Tell, just say it because I don't want to have to say it. Just tell Grady what you did. He asked, who does he think, who do we think is winning the NBA championship? And I said, in terms of like placing a bet, I would place a bet on Dallas Mavericks because oh. of the odds. Because of the Put odds. The camera on Grady, please. Because, <laughs> oh, wow, man. Because, no, I only did, but here's, but here's my reason. My reason is because with the, with the Nets and the Lakers, I'm just not going to get that much money out of it because they're the favorites. They're the favorites. Dallas is like plus. I, and then oh, Grady, I asked so or something you, like that. Not because you believe it, but the bet needs to be worthwhile. I don't believe in anybody right now, Grady. I don't believe in any. <laughs> this is what I was trying to say last week. They kept trying to get an answer out of me. I was like, I don't believe in anybody right now. Because my thing is, like, I, I agree. Like, if you turn off injuries, <laughs> then the Nets and the Lakers will probably go to the finals. Like, they'll probably be the two teams. I think, um, you know, in the East, it'll be the Nets or the Bucks, And then in the West... Yeah. The Lakers, I mean, if you turn off injuries, you make Kawhi Leonard and Jamal Murray healthy. So I actually think that Denver or the Clippers could emerge from there. But basically, it'd be two of those five teams. But since you can't turn off injuries, I'm scared of every single team in the NBA. All the teams that we're talking about in terms of injury histories, because everyone has something. Everyone has something significant. And some of them, in the case of Dallas, uh, not Dallas, in the case of Denver and in the case of the Clippers, they're coming into the season with significant injuries and then other guys like are the Lakers going to make it through the Nets we already know and then they might have other issues besides injuries um we'll see what happens with you know Miami's older uh Boston is coming off you know where Jalen Brown just got hurt last year for a significant amount are they even that good Philadelphia you always have to worry about that with Joel Embiid Portland's not that team as you said and you go on down the line, like, this kind of is what it is. So I don't feel comfortable picking anybody at this point. That's really where I stand. With that being said, with that being said, uh, Grady, the Nets, you know, they made some changes. They made some tweaks this offseason. What did you think of the offseason moves the Nets made? And did that make them a better team for the 2021-22 season? It absolutely made them a better team. And this, in the same way that the P.J. Tucker pickup for the Milwaukee Bucks was a game changer for them. So what the Nets lost in guys who can go out there and get buckets, they made up for this offseason by getting guys who can go out there and get stops. And in the playoffs, you need as many of those guys as possible. So you add a Patty Mills who can not only get buckets on the offensive side of the the floor, but can, can play menacing defense and pick you up full court. And so you add that guy to the mix. If you have any issues with... Kyrie Irving not to be able to play however many games, you have a guy in Patty Mills who you feel very comfortable in. You lose a Landry Shaman, but you add a Patty Mills. Javon Carter, only known for defense. That's a guy who can get out after it, uh, even though he's a guard. He can st- he's still strong enough to guard multiple positions. DeAndre Bembry is a defensive guy to bring back Bruce Brown, who is a very tenacious defender in his own right and showed some stuff a career-high field goal percentage on the offensive end last season. Blake Griffin is back. Uh, so I really do like the additions that the Nets had. The main thing, of course, is the core three and making sure that those guys are healthy and available. And if you have James, Kyrie, and Kevin, no matter what, 
no matter what, you're going to have a superstar Hall of Fame offensive juggernaut on the court. Kyrie checks out, James checks out, whatever it may be. You're going to have one or two of those guys on the floor at all times, and that's unfair. A team like Dallas, as soon as Luka goes to the bench, <laughs> take advantage. Mm -hmm. Atlanta, as soon as Trae Young goes to the bench, take advantage. J James Harden practices just as much with the second unit as he does with the actual starters because that's the way Steve Nash staggers the lineup. And you have James who helps make everybody eat and then he looks for his own shot. So it's, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a um, at full strength. At full strength and when they're focused, uh, they're an they're a unfair situation. And then now they have better defensive pieces that they can throw out there um, I mean, they, I've seen defensive lineups that just look extremely tough with Javon Carter and Patty Mills in the backcourt. Uh, they throw Bruce Brown in there. Nicholas Claxton, we know how versatile of a defender he is. Paul Millsap, even at his age, you know, can still get things done on the defensive side of the ball. They have lineups defensively that can cause some problems, too. And, and again, it's a very, very hungry group. I think that's going to make Nets fans excited about the improvements they could see on defense. But one of the things you mentioned, uh, Grady, you talked about not only the team just being healthy, but having players available. There's been a lot talked about with Kyrie Irving and his vaccination status, especially in how it impacts players who will be playing here in New York. Do you feel like the whole situation being up in the air, we do not know at the moment of recording this whether Kyrie Irving has been vaccinated or not. Do you feel like that can become a distraction for the team in the Brooklyn Nets? I think this group is tight enough and they're deep enough to where it's not a distraction. If this was, again, using the examples before, if we're talking about Luka Doncic in Dallas and Luka had a similar stance and they were playing, let's just say they were in New York, of course, with the rules that they have here, um, that could potentially be a distraction because it's dramatically impacting your season. The Nets are so deep that, of course, Nets fans want to see Kyrie Irving play every single home game. They don't need him to play every single home game. Let's just be honest. You know, so uh, this group is that tight, that close knit to where if this situation isn't resolved in worst case scenario, he is missing home games. Um, they're a close knit group and they're tight enough that it won't become a distraction. And the fact that they should win more than they lose and they're deep enough again, you insert Patty, you do whatever. Um, they're going to be okay, even from a win-loss uh, scenario. So uh, it's it's a uh, it's a tough situation. It's a situation I talked to Sean Marks about this um, in the middle of last week. It's a situation they're still very confident is going to get resolved before the start of the season. What that looks like, what that resolution is, whatever it may be, we don't have the answers right now. Um, but they're very hopeful um, that this is going to work itself out. But just from a continuity, from a chemistry standpoint. These guys are close enough to where it's not going to fracture the group and they're good enough that it's not going to have a dramatic effect on wins and losses. That's, 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 good, to, that's good to hear about the group. Now, with that being said, too, Grady, you say that this is a strong, closely uh, knit group. They, they are ready. They, they know there's championship aspirations. This is what's out on the table. But with that, last year, I think a lot of people thought the Nets could win. But this year, it's like, the Nets better win. There's kind of that attitude, that vibe out there around that. Do you feel like with you, what you just said about the group being so closely knit, can this team handle the pressure of the championship aspirations that are being placed upon them from all the people outside, whether it's media, fans, whatever it may be? Do you feel like the Nets can handle the pressure of being title favorites? Yeah, they're not really dodging the expectations at all. And I've asked just about each guy about this, and everybody's a little bit different. There are guys like James who say, yeah, we're supposed to win and we will win and scary hours and get ready and buckle up. And this is what we're about. And yada, yada, yada. We, you know, we're going to be unstoppable. And he just speaks from that standpoint. And his game really backs up that talk and from what we've seen. Can't wait to see him for an extended stretch, you know, in the playoffs. If he can stay healthy. Um, there are guys who just aren't really active on social media or sports talk radio or pay attention and just really don't care what people on the outside are saying. And then there's other guys, um, Patty Mills in particular, Steve Nash talks like this all the time as the head coach. If you're not finding yourself in a pressure situation, what are you doing? What are we, what are we here for? This is fun. 
a pressure situation where people are expecting you to win. People are trying to take your head off over the course of an 82 game schedule coming for your throat in the playoffs. Who doesn't want to be in a situation like this? Bring it on. So there's different personalities on this roster for sure, but they all feel like, okay, yeah, people are going to talk about us. We can go on a losing stretch. We can go on whatever. I mean, they dealt with just about everything you could think of last season from contact tracing to Kyrie's absence for stretch, the addition of James Harden, couldn't beat the Cleveland Cavaliers after acquiring James Harden, going through a little bit of a lull there to figuring all that stuff out. Injuries, injuries to Kevin Durant. Um, Kevin Durant got hurt in, in the first of five games on a West Coast road trip, which included games against Phoenix, the Lakers, and the Clippers. The first game was against the Golden State Warriors. Kevin Durant got hurt that game, next one, and then they won the other four games on that West Coast road trip. That's never been done before by the Nets. And they did that last season, even with Kevin Durant being out of the lineup. And in the game against Phoenix, James Harden didn't have Kyrie Irving in that game either. And he let it have to come back and they pulled it out. So they, ha they have guys who have seen just about everything that you could throw at them. And so dealing with Stephen A. Smith ranting about them in the morning, <laughs> dealing with sports talk radio, giving up crap, or dealing with social media trolls, it's not going to affect dudes. I mean, when you look at this roster, bro, I mean, it's yeah. like 17 years in the league, 16 years in the league, 15 years in the league, 12 years in the league, 17 years in the league. It's crazy, man. They, they, this, is a, this is a group that knows what they're getting into. Some are always looking for more sports content. And among the glut of sports media, some are looking for sports content that dives a bit deeper and doesn't just stick to sports. So check out Backpack Broadcasting's original long-form sports journalism series, Sideline Stories. The award-winning original series takes viewers directly into underrepresented communities within the world of sports. It's a series that goes beyond traditional sports reporting, like box scores and statistics, presenting exclusive stories that you won't find anywhere else. With a diverse group of correspondents, the series provides interviews and interesting stories around the world of sports, because there is so much beyond the game, and so much that occurs off the field or court that impacts each of us and the world we live in. Giving a voice to athletes, coaches, fans, and everyone involved in athletics, Sideline Stories looks to push sports storytelling further than ever before. It's a winner of the 2020 Independent Shorts Awards, and all episodes of Sideline Stories are available for viewing today on Backpack Broadcasting's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Let me ask you this, because we saw, obviously, Milwaukee, I mean, we have questions about whether or not uh, they would have legitimately, you know, finished them off had, you know, the Nets been healthy or Kevin Durant's they foot been a little smaller, et cetera, you said, et cetera. You said they, you said they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Have. Okay. They would. I, 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 yeah. I tend to agree with that. But, Me too. you know, there's a certain confidence that guys talk about when, you know, you actually get over the hump and get a championship. And although, you know, the situation and the circumstances were in Milwaukee's favor last year, they did get it done behind Giannis, behind Chris Middleton, et cetera, Drew Holiday. Um, and then, shit, Drew Holiday went out and won a gold medal with Kevin Durant on that same team uh, together during the summer. So, I don't know. Do you think that that is going to like just boost their confidence and ease them a little bit and remove some of that pressure from Milwaukee? And are they going to play freer this year? And if so, is that a threat to the Nets, you know, in any sort of respect? The 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 main threat is that Giannis is a different breed. That's that's the main thing. I think that um, I, we all can both things can be true. If the Nets were 100 um, percent, Milwaukee's not winning that series, period. It's also true that they finished off the Nets, they finished off Atlanta, and Giannis went supernova in that NBA Finals against the Phoenix Suns, and they deserve credit for winning an NBA championship. That is also very, very true. That said, I think we all want to see a full-strength Milwaukee Bucks team against a full-strength uh, Brooklyn Nets team. And uh, I would be, for one, extremely excited to see that slugfest, no matter how it turns out. If Milwaukee wins that series, I'm a basketball fan first. So I, I think it would take some amazing performances and I would enjoy it with my popcorn. Um, uh, but that's, that's still something in the back of Milwaukee's mind. Even when James Harden went down like 60 seconds into game one of the Eastern Conference semis, the Nets went out and smoked them in those two games with Kyrie and, and Kevin Durant. Like smoked them in those first two games. And then when Kyrie went down with the ankle injury, 
that's of course when the series series shifted in Milwaukee's favor. But they were laying waste to them with just two of the superstars. So yeah, in a in a big time stage, big time moment, who knows what'll happen and you know, they, they face each other in a preseason game coming up, but they they'll face each other um to uh to start the uh the regular season and milwaukee may win that game who knows but it's, it, it's still a different animal when you're talking about those guys being locked in come playoff time so again the big threat though is Giannis and his mentality uh i'm so impressed with that dude i'm so impressed with the way that he carries himself i'm so yeah. impressed with his dog mentality um to be made fun of at the free throw line basically the entirety of the playoffs Shaq didn't get me. I mean, we make fun of Shaq and whatever, but they weren't counting when this brother was at the free throw line the way they were counting to be honest, and right. howling, laughing as he bricked shot after shot. And even though he was bricking those shots, he still was aggressive in getting to the basket. Meanwhile, yep. Ben Simmons is dumping the yep. ball off from a yep. T-stock dive. So <laughs> yeah. it's like he kept coming. He kept coming. And I respect that. I respect the hell out of that, man. And then what was he doing in that final game of the NBA Finals? Man, he was knocking those free throws down. So yeah, um, that's a that's a dog right there. Yeah, yeah, and then and then you mentioned you know you broke down basically the Eastern Conference earlier, but we're looking at in the East at least the Nets and Milwaukee being those top two teams. Who among the other teams, I guess, is best suited to break into that threshold? Because I do think that the Nets and Milwaukee are the top two, and then from there it's like a pool of between you know uh, Philly, Miami. Uh, Atlanta, yeah. you know, Boston, whoever, maybe the Knicks, maybe Dexter's Knicks can creep in there. You know what I mean? They had a pretty good off season. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. Um, uh, but Brady, don't, don't say that. You might piss off some of the Nets fan base if you say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. no. But, but who, who do you, who do you think, who do you think is their biggest threat there? Because I, I would say it's Miami to the surprise of not Dexter or anybody here. But yeah, well, well, number one, we need to see what Philadelphia eventually gets in return for Ben Simmons. Uh, they are going to make that move at some point, and I don't think they're going to get equal value, but could it be a fit that still makes them very difficult? I mean, we can't forget the fact that Joel Embiid was an MVP candidate a season ago, so he's still going to be an issue for teams night in and night out, and he stays hungry. Um, they still have very good players on that roster and they're going to get more talent. They're not going to, they should not get draft picks. They're still going to get some more talent in return. So, um, so yeah, I like, I like, I like, uh, I, I'm curious to see what they do. Um, Tobias Harris, who I was forgetting, had a very strong season a season ago. We know that he's a solid player in this league. Uh, so we'll see what they get in return. If Philadelphia could be that third team, but there is still a gap between the top two and the next squad. So, um, uh, I say Miami. We'll see what happens with Philadelphia, but Philadelphia is right there. Um, uh, Atlanta, I, I'm, I really love what they did last season. And when you have a special season like that, it could be, I really keep an eye on whether or not that could potentially be um, a letdown. I think Trey Young is going to be special, but those other guys all have to elevate their game to another level um, for them to to even have a chance to get back to a conference finals. Um, yeah, on top of that, you mentioned the Celtics. I just don't believe in the Celtics, man. I just feel like that that whole situation, even though uh, Tatum and Brown are still extremely young, um, I, I, I'm a big fan of Marcus Smart because he's, again, a dog mentality kind of dude. But I just don't feel like they have the right mix. I just don't feel like they have the right guys to complement each other to really put a team out there to be a threat in the Eastern Conference. Um, and, and that's... With while saying that they have two of the brightest uh, young stars in, in the NBA, they still just don't have the right mix. So I don't take the Celtics um, that seriously as a threat. Um, Indiana has had talent. You know, my roots are in Indiana. I still, I still kind of keep an eye on them. They have talent. Um, they just can't stay healthy. They can't stay healthy. I mean, the, you go to the look at their roster. It's a respectable respectable group. For sure. With Brogdon and Karis LeVert and, yeah. you know, Miles Turner and uh, of course, their big man Sabonis. Um, you know, uh, T.J. Warren didn't play last season. He's back in the mix. Um, I like their I like their rookie uh, Duarte. So they have some players, but it's always something with Indiana. And I think I, I think um, uh, having a new head coach in the mix and, and bringing in Carlisle is going to help them out too. 
So, um, so yeah, there's definitely talent in the Eastern Conference. I'm forgetting some. I'm forgetting teams, but um, you know, the Knicks will be interesting. Um, uh, but that's another situation. How do you follow up what you did a season ago? Yep. Because uh, mentally, sometimes if you're not having the same success, if you're taking losses, can you stay mentally tough enough to not let those mm-hmm. losses snowball? And that's what will be interesting to see with both New York and Atlanta this season. Yeah, no, I, th- I, I definitely think you're right about that. All right, a couple more questions before we get you out of here, Grady. We're going to – we're gonna one more last sports question, then we're going to kind of shift away from that to some hip-hop. Um, yeah. You've been – you know, you've been sideline reporting for the Nets. Uh, you talked about, you know, doing some of the play-by-play, also doing some of the sideline stuff around the NFL and college football. When we talked to you last year, and I talked to you a little bit through the season and, and stuff – you know, we talked about how weird it was going to be to be in these arenas when there were no fans. And we saw the evolution of that and the fans coming back. Now you you did games. You did a playoff game. I saw you last time. The job that you do where you were used to doing it with fans in the building. Then there weren't fans in the building. Now you have fans back in the building. What's it like to just have... You know... Um... It was it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable, my man. Because uh, our whole lives we've seen nothing but fans in the building, and to have that taken away for a stretch, and to not have that energy. Um, because I always talk about like this this holy trinity of um, of game broadcasts. You have the the players, of course. Um, you have the announcers who are you know um, describing the action. And then you have the fans who are providing the juice, who are giving the energy. And to have that equation taken away and taken away for an extended period of time, man, it's just crazy how you could get used to something like that. Um, and then when fans were brought back in the building and players are dealing deal with this too. I, I was talking to Blake Griffin. I was talking to a number of different guys. And these guys were like, bro, when, they, when it was a packed house again for that first playoff game against the Celtics, we were shook. Like shook mm. to see, I mean, the energy and guys were, you know, extra, extra hyped. And sometimes when you're extra hyped, you could be too much. You could be, you know, thrown off, a little bit rusty out there. And they said it took some time to get used to all that energy being back in the building. And it just makes a, it makes a world of difference, man. It's, it's, uh, it, it goes from pickup game atmosphere to, oh my God. So, uh, I, I think it helps everybody. I think it helps the players. Uh, I'm so happy for the fans and those who get to see their favorite teams again and be out in these arenas. It certainly helps the broadcasters from an energy standpoint. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so be able to do some of the, like the college football, for example. Um, the college football fans being back, you know, in these stadiums or whatnot just brings extra juice. It brings extra, you know, I was at, uh, what was, I did a, a game at Utah State. And we basically had monsoon and lightning, which delayed the game for about 90 minutes um, before we were able to go on air. And the fans didn't leave. It was the first time they had had a game since 2019. And even though it, they were getting poured on, nobody had umbrellas. It was a whiteout night. They didn't leave. They were just just happy to be back in the stadium. And it was it was crazy to see because they were playing songs and they were singing along with it. And, uh, man, the fan experience is everything. You know what I mean? I, can, I, I enjoy being on the broadcast for these games. But like I told you, and Brian, like a thousand times, man, I'm a fan first. And um, right. I love the energy and, and being around the fans. And uh, it was exciting to see them back in the building in Barclay Center and, and, and around the country. Man, it's been amazing to see. Yeah, man, just getting back in it with some fans. Well, we talked about when I saw you at the Game 5, that was a – Tremendous experience. Oh. Um, just being it, being it. I think it was the first time I've been to a Nets playoff game where I wasn't a member of the media, I, working it as a member of the media. And it was just the energy and what KD did that night. Man, it was just, uh, that was just crazy. It was crazy. All right, to some hip hop. Now, Greg, my producer, I'm, I'm switching the last two for a reason that, that Grady will see in a minute. Grady, the first time you were on this podcast, you <laughs> shared with us a story about uh, Lauren Hill. And you going to see Lauren Hill, and of course she was late. You you know you, you told us the story about that, and I thought it was funny. So as you probably saw, because the hip hop head that you I know you are, you saw the Fugees are back, and they have their they got their comeback tour, and they had their little tour uh, down on uh, down at Pier Seventeen. They had it had it down there, and they 
were three hours late, which three I was hours like, late. Yeah, it's predictable. Which I, I don't know about you, Grady, but I would have been like, yeah, I don't need to really necessarily go to that show. <laughs> um, I, I've seen Lauren before, and I had the same experience as you. She she was late. I love everybody knows. You know me. I love Lauren Hill. So this is no shade to Lauren Hill. Um, the Fuji's coming back and reuniting on a tour. If they were to do another show in New York City, would you go? Considering your experience last time with Miss Lauren Hill showing up, and <laughs> and and they and reportedly they did, and were three and a half hours late or something along those lines. Three and a half so, hours late, and they did seven for like songs, a secret show or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I that's a no. That's a no. Myself. I would subject <laughs> myself to that punishment once again. <laughs> you would. <laughs> But if it's you know, cause it's you know, seeing Lauren, seeing Lauren is one thing. Um and if it was just Lauren, I'm I'm good. I've had my fill of that. But to see the Fuji's together, Lauren, like I still have love for Lauren. I just I just don't want to wait three hours. Um, for that, you know, uh like I saw that before. So but three hours to see Wyclef, to like to see like the Fuji's, like all three of them. Come on, bro. I I, I was subject myself to that punishment. Wow. I was talking. I was um I was messaging some folks like, man, where's these hey, DC? Like, where are we going? Like, where's where are we going? Oh, going so, you're, oh so you're trying you to make this happen? It? Okay, you trying to make this happen? Okay, trying to make trying to trying to make it happen. Now okay. the challenge is, what time do you show up? <laughs> <laughs> like it's one thing to say you're going. Like I'm not telling you if the show starts at seven, bruh, I'm not showing up at seven. No. So the challenge is what time what time do you show up? So that's what that's that's the challenge right I now. Feel like yeah, I'm going, show, I'm going. I feel like if the show starts at seven, you gotta at least aim to be there in that nine, nine yep. thirty range. I was thinking guy. But but <laughs> nine thirty. But great. Yo, but it's like regular party rules. You know how you never show up to a party early? Like, that's all it is to me. Like, when the door is open at 7 or whatever, like, yeah, I'm getting the there thing at is, 9. And, and, and <laughs> unless, uh, Grady, unless you got some VIP access, the thing is, you know you're foregoing uh, being closer to the stage, right? Yeah. Which, you know, sometimes that's great for a show. Sometimes it's not necessarily necessary. You know, it's not necessary. Yeah. But, yeah, 9.30 sounds about right. That sounds you know, what, they, what, what they got to do, if, I mean, if they had a, you know, a dope DJ, you know what I mean? Like right. if, I don't know who the DJ will be, but if the DJ is somebody crazy, okay, then maybe or, I can, you might show up earlier. Or to yeah, Dex's you know, point, maybe I show up a little earlier. Or to Dex's point, maybe the maybe the the sort of hack in all this is just get get a VIP, pay extra, yeah, yeah, and get that it, VIP so that like you're just chilling the entire time. Yeah. And I need somebody <laughs> at the arena or venue to tip me off to be like, this is when the Fujis are en route to said place yeah, to perform. Right. Then I will leave. If you're like, VIP, that's you might get that. Do. You might yeah. get that. It'll be like it'll be it. it'll be like the chick over the loudspeaker when you're on the subway and your next stop is whatever. Like yeah. that's probably all it'll be. You get that alert. <laughs> Which yeah, is to coming. See, you're good. To, to 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 hear you know ready or not zealots um, Fuji live, bro. Uh, yes. Feeling me softly, like to to hear that live, man. Come on, that'd man. be dope. Okay, yeah. all right. So so Grady is in on on the return of the Fujis and trying X to are you? Concert. Um, if I get for, so two caveats, I'm in if I'm rolling with Grady and Grady and I can get the information about exactly when the show will be. Oh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm straight. There I'm there. I'm there. I'm definitely there. Uh, Grady, before we get you out of here, um, you know we always like talk some more hip hop too. What have you been listening to this year? Any albums you really love this year? What's been your hip hop favorites for 2021 thus far? Oh, man, so um. I've been kind of bouncing. Usually I put together a playlist when there's like multiple albums out at the same time and I'll just put like a playlist together uh, and like pull songs. But I've been kind of bouncing between albums. So obviously the whole the whole um, Donda, uh, Certified Lover Boy, that whole thing. Um, uh, neither of them classics, but, but both, you know, but each have like songs that you can rock with that you'll skip ahead to or whatever it may be. Donda was all over the place, and unfortunately, the best song on Donda never made it on Donda. Are you with talking about Andre, the one with Andre 3000? With Andre 3000. Bro, how good is that verse? How good yeah, is that man, verse? Andre, Ooh. man, it's like, it's like, like, it makes you emotional how good that verse was, bro. Like, it's <laughs> it's crazy, man, to be that gifted a lyricist at his age. And I, I think I may have told you before, I saw him in an interview with um, 
Rick Rubin, and uh, he just wasn't really interested in putting any music out. He wasn't sure that he was going to be accepted. He wasn't sure that people were going to um, be okay with whatever he was experimenting with on his own at that time. And it's like, hey, this is Andre 3000. Like, they breaking barriers, all kind of stuff, like outfits to style and all this other type of stuff. But him opening up about his insecurities with uh, Rick, I thought was really fascinating, really fascinating to watch. So anytime I hear him drop a verse or come out with something or, or have a feature, it's like, oh, it's not, oh, man, this is awesome. Somebody got him out. Like somebody brought him out. Yeah. And, and so Ye brought him out and he gave a amazing verse, which was the best tribute to Kanye's mom, including all of Kanye verses on Donda. Sorry. Um, it was an amazing, I mean, it was just an amazing verse. Then the, for Kanye to do, for Kanye to like to have his verse and then whatever the reasons, I didn't quite understand how it couldn't quite make the album. But nevertheless, I was just, I thought that out, I thought that track was bananas. I guess um, that, that, that's crazy because there's, there's another, I don't know, Grady, if you heard this, but um, there's another Andre 3000 verse that was floating out there that would have been on a Kanye project. Uh, and it was scrapped. It was on Cop Shot the Kid on the Nazir oh, joint. Yeah, I remember the that. Nods. Okay. Oh. And there's an Andre 3000 verse on that that is somewhere. You could Twitter it, whatever. I, yeah, I don't yeah. remember like who posted it or whatever. That verse was nuts. Okay? Like that okay. verse on that beat. He he got into a pocket. Like I didn't think it was possible when I first heard that beat or whatever. Um, and speaking yeah. of, another thing I wanted to ask you was uh, since we had you on to talk about King's yeah. Disease 1 when that dropped. Have you been able to sit with King's Disease 2 since Nas came out again? Yeah. A little sooner than we expected, but yeah, that was the album yeah. that we really That's that we definitely. really enjoyed up here. And a lot of people Man. are saying it's better than part one, so I don't know where you stand on that. Uh, yeah, so it came out, one of my guys who used to work for the Nets now, and then uh, moved out to uh, Denver. We, we love talking about Nas. Alex. Nas. Shout out to Alex. Yeah, yeah my Alex, guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, he was in my wedding, man. That's, that's, that's my guy, man. Um, I, I, I loved it, um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of great tracks on it. The two, uh, even today, the two that I keep playing, and I know people, people are like this. You may have a phase where, okay, I'm rocking, I'm, I keep playing back these tracks, and then you have yeah. a phase where, okay, now I'm rocking with these. So right now, I keep playing back um, Rare and uh, Composure, and um, um. I keep playing those over and over again, man. So. Uh, composure is just something about the horns, man. It's just something about, I don't know, man. I just, um, something about brass and a hip hop record, man. It's just, it's just crazy, man. So I, I love that. And then there's just something about, um, the way Rare starts off, man. And, uh, that beat, uh, it's, it's a great partnership. Nas and Hit Boy, man, for real. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, um, uh, love that album, man. I, um, I was putting together my hierarchy or whatever. And um, the debate that, that uh, Alex and I had was about life is good and um, and King's Disease too, and I still love Life is Good, man. Uh, uh, I think so, I think Life too. is Good is slightly better. I agree. Yeah, 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 me yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we were uh, we were yeah we were debating that with with like fresh ears after we had just heard um, uh, King's Disease too. So yeah, I thought it was a great effort from Nas. I love that he still man added still has love for it, and I love a great partnership between an artist and a producer. Um, but I really love, really love those two tracks on the album. And um, yeah, man, inside of that, I know um, Baby Keem, you know, allows us to listen to, you know, hear Kendrick Lamar again. And, and, mm. and that, their tracks together were crazy. Um, uh, West Side Gun, um, there's some tracks on that. Um, it's a lot of tracks on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what's the, uh, the Margiela Split Tone? Um, yep. That's one, uh, man, it, it's, I don't have a car out here in New York. And that's one that I just want to, like. Ride to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I that old cover, man, that just, like, that's one you just want to ride around the city in, right? So, um, so yeah, there's some, there's, some, there's some good stuff on that one. I'm probably forgetting something, but. Do you, have a, ha, do you have a favorite album yet this year, Grady? Is there one you feel like is leaps? We get to this at the end of the year, but is there one that you feel is mm -hmm. leaps and bounds better than everything else or that you've really been coming back to consistently? <sighs> That's a tough one, man. Um, give, me a, give me a hierarchy right now, because right now I'm playing about the same number of tracks 
off of each of these each of these albums that we're that we're talking about. I think I think I think King's Disease too. I think it's got to be got to be up there, and I may put that as a favorite. Um, even though Donda's all over the place and people feel a kind of way about um, Kanye, I think there's enough good stuff in. I think there's enough good stuff in there that it's not throwaway. Um, uh, Drake is always going to be Drake, but I, I, um, and while there are tracks on there that I really like, it's not, I, I don't, I don't think it's like one of his best efforts or whatever. I think it's Drake is going to be Drake is perfect. That's yeah, the perfect I mean? way to say that. Yeah, did you like, did like, you like J. Cole? Did you like J. Cole's off season? Um, I did, you know, it's been a, it's been a minute and I, I've been meaning, especially with him touring to go back and like revisit that album and, 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 mm. and go to, um. And and just kind of revisit the album. I remember I enjoyed it. I remember there were a couple of tracks on it that I liked, um, but it it wasn't it, it wouldn't be in my album of the year category though. And I'm a big I'm a big J Cole guy. I'm a big yes. J Cole guy. Uh, who else we forgetting? A lot of the Grady. I don't know. Again, if... the, the, I, 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 right now I'm giving the edge to Nas, um, but. But there, there's multiple reasons for that. Am I forgetting? Yeah. <laughs> what well, I know, I gotta be. No, nah, there's a lot. We we have some stuff that we'll talk about. A, I mean, there's a there's a speaking of Lauren Hill. There's a great Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill verse on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's absolutely. that too. I, I was uh, listening to that earlier, and I know she made the line about the you know the lateness. I, I'm, I'm, you, <laughs> y'all talking about my lateness? Yeah. Yes, we're gonna talk about your lateness. I don't <laughs> but she's out here saving souls, though, Grady. She's saving she souls. Sa- and. Sa- Save souls and organize your days. So you <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel you, man. I just also want to add: there's been a lot of good stuff. We've talked about this, Dex. A lot yes. of good stuff coming out of the UK. Yeah, a lot of good stuff coming time. out of the UK. Lil Sims, who's phenomenal, uh, dropped a great album this year. Dave, not Dave from Hulu, but Dave <laughs> from the U, from Top Boy, actually. So another okay, show. Okay. Um, yeah, Dave dropped a great album. AJ Tracy dropped a good, very good album, one of my favorites that came out this year. I was telling Dex uh, about it that he should listen to it. And uh, an artist named Getz, G H E T T S. He he's made right. songs with like Jada Kiss and dudes like that before. I'm forgetting who's on the album right now, but those are those are four that I really like that came out of the UK this year that we may or may not talk about in our year end hip hop wrap up. I love it, man. Speaking yeah. speaking of that, and we got to let you go, Grady, because you're giving us more time than we even thought. Uh, we could probably got to get you on one day to just do a straight hip hop podcast. Yeah, we I'm won't even it. talk. We won't even talk nets, which will probably piss some people off. But you know, whatever. We, <laughs> we, we can just I'm, talk hip hop. We, we, we can talk hip hop, man. We we always love and having I, you. Go ahead. I trust. I trust you guys because you know Brian. Brian put me on to Freddie Gibbs, man, and uh, it's like hey, Indiana dude, you should know about Freddie, man. And I'm I'm a I'm a Freddie guy now, man. I'm a Freddie guy. So you guys, Here we you go. guys put me on to stuff, and man, I'm I uh, I don't get to listen to everything, so I. I um, and uh, you don't get to hear radio as much anymore. You know, like when right. we were younger, we hear radio all the time. Yeah. So it's conversations like this. So I'm like, oh, I bet I got to check this cat out. So Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we have some more recommendations for you. But yeah, next time you come on, we got to do a straight hip hop episode. We'll, we'll, we'll get that done. But Mike, uh, we always appreciate you on. We love the work you do on the Yes Network. You know, I appreciate you whenever you give us some time to, to chat and talk. And I'm pretty sure I'll see you pretty soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime, brothers. One time for your mind, one time. Got some interesting stuff to talk about this week. Brian will talk about violence, and I'll be talking about the thing that Brian generally sometimes talks about, which is how things should be going in the workplace. Brian, oh. <laughs> Brian did not know where that was going at all whatsoever. I Brian. mean, look, <laughs> it, it, it could go one of a lot of different ways. According to some people who have read Hidalgo Heights, it could have been porn related. So we'll just leave that there. I would, anyway, continue. Although there is a reference to porn in the second chapter of Hidalgo Heights, but I'll leave that there. Go there's find more, out. There's more, you know. there's more as you go. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't gotten that far to know, but I'm sure there is. Brian, what do you have for one time for your mind? <laughs> Uh, teenagers watch pornography. Um, what we have on one time for your mind today is a sports-related thing, which we don't typically do for one time for your mind, but we're going to do that here because we didn't have a uh, room to put it in the main show. But Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder for the third time, the trilogy fight. We don't get a lot of trilogies anymore, Dex. Nah, we don't get a lot don't. of trilogies nah, anymore. So this is it's a very good trilogy. Now, for some background, a little bit of background, because we don't want to you know, take too much time on this and we want to get to our picks, so to speak. But Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder memorably had, you know, their first fight 
uh, I believe it was two years ago. It was definitely before COVID. It was two, three years ago, something along those lines. And uh, a lot of us thought, I remember actually it was late 2018 because I remember we were still at the old Gotham podcast studio uh, location. Wow. So basically it was a draw. Many of us thought Tyson Fury outboxed Deontay Wilder and should have won on points, um, you know, 115, 111, or 116, 110, something along those lines. And the scoring was a little wonky because, remember, Deontay Wilder had some knockdowns in that fight um, and nearly knocked out Tyson Fury, who got back up, I believe, in round 12, Undertaker style. And it was a, it was a tremendous fight, Dex. Like, we remember mm. doing podcasts on that, and this is why I was saying we need 11 round title fights in boxing and there's still 12 rounds so we're still going to get draws but anyway they had their rematch and Tyson Fury won and stopped Deontay Wilder and Deontay Wilder has since you know switched trainers I think fired Mark Breland and you know now he's working with I want to say Malik Scott whom he knocked out in the first round uh in 2014 in one of their fights and look we'll see what ends up happening but uh Deontay Wilder still has the most power in the division but He's clearly been exposed to a heavy degree uh, by Tyson Fury, who looks like the best heavyweight in the world uh, from a pure boxing standpoint. And like, I can't wait for it. But if if Deontay Wilder wins, it gets very interesting because it's like you're going to have to do it a fourth time because there's a win each and a draw. So we'll see what ends up happening uh, right now for odds purposes, for betting purposes. We'll use FanDuel here. Um and I was looking this up, Dex. I want to see where you stand. Mm-hmm. Tyson Fury on the money line, minus 350 favorite. Not surprising to me. Deontay Wilder, plus 250 underdog. And if you want a better draw, that's plus 2,000. Uh, Fury by KO, minus 110 by points, plus 270. So they don't think it's going to distance over there. Mm, uh, Deontay Wilder, plus 310 by knockout and plus 1,600 on points, which... I agree with, I wouldn't put, I would never bet Deontay Wilder on points. (laughs) That's not how he's going to get it done. So I I think Tyson Fury uh, uh, wins this. And this comes two weeks after Oleksandr Usyk upset Anthony Joshua. Completely, completely outboxed him. And it wasn't even close. Okay, so there's a new world heavyweight champion anyway. I think the loser should face Anthony Joshua. And I think the winner should face Usyk. And that's probably what will happen. So... I think uh, I think Tyson Fury takes this by decision, but I won't be surprised if Wilder knocks him out because he could do that. Um, I'm hoping Wilder knocks him out. I, I, I'm not a fan of Tyson Fury. I get Tyson, it. I understand. Tyson Fury, as uh, Brian would say, has one of those punchable faces, and we're hoping that Wilder will get <laughs> some punches on him in this one. Um, but I understand the betting reasons why you would go with Fury. And right. what we've seen from all these fighters and seen from Fury recently, like, look, I was shocked at how dominant Fury looked against Wilder in the second fight. I was really shocked at that. Um, Wilder, I guess I could say I was more shocked that he looked like he didn't come ready to box. You know, there's a whole thing about the outfit he had on and whether it was too heavy and all that. And it's like, okay, and what I want to see from Wilder, at least it's like, look, man, come out focused. We don't need all that, okay? We just need you to come out and box. Forget about being hyped about the entrance music. Forget about all this stuff. The point that Brian makes that I think is good about this really quickly is the thing about Wilder that we know to be true. We have seen this man struggle before. We saw him struggle. Luis Ortiz basically had him on the ropes, and he showed you the comeback power that he can have to get a knockout, right? B, we know that this can happen. So I'm rooting for that with Wilder. If I was betting on this and I wanted to take Wilder, I think maybe where you can get some good values, putting your money in what was Wilder by knockout was like plus 350, something like that. Go, if you're going to bet Wilder, go with the way you think that he most likely is going to win. I'm with Brian on this. He's not going to go to distance. He's not winning this on points. That's not his game. If this is going to distance and it becomes very technical, but we got to decide this by points, eh, probably advantage Fury there. Don't necessarily love that. But look, I'm entertained by this. I will be watching this. Uh, I'm sure I'll be texting with Brian talking about this. Maybe we'll do something special around this. Absolutely. So and the, and the biggest 
the biggest thing I want to stretch in my thing with Deontay Wilder is we need to see the improvements because Tyson Fury read him like a book. He was clearly like telegraphing his overhand right the entire time set up by the jab. Um, sometimes it would be a hook. And Tyson Fury would just slip him and just uppercut him, slip him and jab him, just slip him and keep his distance. Like he was doing that all night long. And it was very easy, especially the second time around. Like you really uh, telegraphed it. He really telegraphed it there. And then Deontay, Deontay Wilder did catch him in the first fight, but again, Tyson Fury got up. So we'll see what ends up happening. But Tyson, uh, Deontay Wilder needs to get better as a boxer, and he's somebody who's already kind of mm-hmm. late in his career, though he was a late starter, you know, mm-hmm. Olympic bronze medalist in, I believe, 2008. But he's somebody who's in his mid-30s at this point. So if he doesn't make adjustments, so this is why you get a new trainer, like, we'll see. We'll see. I believe... Uh, that he, you know, will be better, but I'm I'm not sure if it'll be good enough all around. Because Tyson Fury, he's that dude. I can't lie. Uh, I know I, I I'm Tyson Fury. I hate to say it, but he has looked really good. We'll see what happens <laughs> with that fight. We'll be talking about that next week for sure. All right, for my one time for your mind, uh, this involves work. Brian always talks a lot about this. Are we truly changing the culture of work? Are things changing? One of the topics I came across this article. I want to pull this up so I don't get the uh, author wrong on this. This was an article by Vox Media. Google's plan to cut pay for re- remote workers who locate is a bad idea. And this was written by Rami Mola. Um, and it was a really good piece that talks about as more people are working remote, specifically in areas of technology in the tech industry, people want to keep those same salaries. But a lot of times people are paid based on the markets they live in. And I've always thought, that's probably not really fair, right? Like if you have a specific skill set, no matter where you're working from, especially in an industry like tech, you should be paid for the demand or the needs of that specific skill set. And as people don't want to return to offices, which Brian and I've talked about more on this podcast, people are going to push more back on that. And I'd say whether you live in uh, San Francisco or around in Silicon Valley or you're doing the job from Austin, Texas, or Boise, Idaho, or whatever it may be, you should still be paid what you're worth as this goes on. There's this whole debate about this because some companies like Google are still trying to force and get people back into the offices. They don't necessarily want to change the salary structure. It's kind of a game of chicken here and how this is going to go. But I think a lot of this rears this ugly head about capitalism. And capitalism is all about hey, can we get people to do this work for the cheapest? This is why so many jobs are outsourced, whether it be China or India or other places like that. And so this really causes a shift where if you're going to pay workers that work in America, should we pay them based on where they live? I say no. I say it should be based on the skill that they do and the value that they bring, especially in a job that can be done remotely. That's the key. If the job can be done remotely, then why not pay them based on the skill and demand of what that is? Now, all these places are trying to get people back into offices. They say that it boosts the company morale and connectivity <laughs> and all that stuff. And that might work in some industries. I'm not knocking that completely. But I do think this is something to watch in terms of remote work. And if people are still able to keep the salaries based on the places they lived before, because we have seen a migration of places of people, particularly in places like Silicon Valley, that have moved to places where the cost of living is lower, but they still want the same salary. I ain't really mad at them for that. Brian, I know you would support this too. I'm not I'm not shocked at this. You feel like the people should get paid uh, what they deserve based on the skill set that they bring to the table, right? I absolutely do. And I do think like, look, there's something to be said for if you're in a bigger market, you should probably like make something reflective of what it takes to live in that market, right? Like I I could probably do remote job X for less money in Florida or in Minnesota than I would in New York, but I think that's more of a market thing, not like what is being discussed here. Now, in terms of the job itself, yeah, you should be paid based on your skill set, your experience. And people say that that's the case, but you know, that would only be the case in a utopia, which we don't currently live in. I am for people uh, who can work from home, uh, you know, that they should be able to. Uh, I'm not anti office, but I do think that for a lot of jobs, clearly, as we can see here, uh, mm-hmm. You don't really need to be in an office five days a week. Dexter and I had been doing this from a podcast studio and a very, very good one uh, that we were proud to have done a uh, podcast there for years. But it's just easier to do it this way, uh, way easier in terms of financially, in terms of 
just like managing your time and it's easier to just you know pause the video game and go over to my laptop and be like all right let's do the pod as opposed to renting out a studio for x amount of hours and then i'm spending my whole saturday there uh and we're recording episodes and then on top of that have we have to edit them and promote them and things of that nature so it's all about working smarter and not harder and uh creating a better work-life balance for yourself so i'm always in support of that and uh, i do think that look there is something to be said for like going into offices and seeing people i would do that but only for a job i enjoy if it's a job I can't stand, then I don't want to see any of you motherfuckers. That's a, that's a good point because if you force people into being back in the office, so as I wrap this up, there's going to be a lot of talk about how is this going to affect people and how they feel about this going going forward. And will they be as productive as they were before? There's going to be at least something to question yep. about that. Uh, but that's it. That's it for this episode of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast, episode 195. Special thanks to our guest, Michael Grady for rocking with us as always. We appreciate him. Please continue to support us any way that you can. For Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace.